Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Yoga Happiness Podcast. I am Burgundy. Uh, today, we're talking with we. Today, I'm talking with Lauren Strawn. Uh, she is a uh, yogi that is local to Columbus, Ohio. Um, and she teaches here in Columbus, Ohio as well in several places, several different studios and whatnot. Um, also what makes her particularly interesting to the conversation that we have today, she's working towards her master in social work and good luck, Lauren. She's hoping to graduate in spring of 2019. Her focus is on mental health and addiction studies and specifically behavioral health counseling. Um, Lauren's classes and workshops combine Buddhist philosophy with intuitive movement that creates strength and resilience while cultivating a gentle heart. Um, she is inspired by the training of Pima children in the way of the Bodhisattva warrior. She strives to live and teach in this way. Um, and one thing that I really enjoy about Lauren's outlook on yoga is that she is, um, she believes in yoga as an evidence-based practice and she partners that with, um, traditional counseling techniques. So the yoga world and the social work world. And, um, in, uh, she also believes that by deepening one's self-study and self-study is called Svadhyaya in Sanskrit, um, one can achieve peaceful calm resilience and strength that can last a lifetime and regardless of what type of physical body that person may inhabit. And Lauren and I agree on another aspect that yoga is meant for everybody and everyone. And so we do talk about that in our discussion. So let's get right to it. Let's talk with Lauren Strawn. I think that, you know, a lot of times as yoga teachers, especially, um, but maybe sort of the yoga culture in general, people on the outside or new students or whatever, sometimes tend to see those people that are already in the yoga community mm -hmm. as having their shit together already. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you must be doing all the right things. Mm -hmm. You only drink tea and you're oh, yeah. purely vegetarian and you live off the earth. Yeah, I've had that a lot. I've had a lot of my friends that maybe don't do yoga say to me that I'm going to live to be like 200 years old and that I probably wake up at 4 a.m. and that I eat only vegan food and then meanwhile I'm like eating my Reese's pumpkin like, while <laughs> they're talking to me. So, yeah. It's, right. It's, yeah, there's definitely an image of us as yoga teachers that it's like... Get up at 4 a.m. before the sun rises and we sit in contemplation for two hours and then we eat a meal of hot water and <laughs> lemon. <laughs> right. You know, and it's and I think that, you know, for for a lot of reasons I I want to have discussions like this because um yoga, you know, I'm I love yoga in I like I love I love many aspects of yoga. Like many things, it's got its dirty laundry, um, and it's got things that I don't do. Same, yeah. You know, and um, I think that the idea that yoga is for everybody is true. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of a type of person that, and by type of person, I mean like body type, um, body size, um, gender, um, uh, any kind of like physical thing, right. there's just a way that you change it up. Right. And even if you look at yoga as a whole, maybe they're not practicing Hatha yoga. Maybe they're practicing some other limb of yoga. Maybe meditation is the thing or maybe right. self-study. There are so many different ways people can get into yoga. And even if it is a physical practice, I think there's something that, that, Probably most people could do, but I think the other piece of that is that they don't believe they can do it because what we're exposed to tends to be like the Instagram yogi yeah. that has a bunch of sponsors and was also probably a gymnast or ballerina for like 15, 20 years before they got into yoga. Right. So they're coming to it from a place that's different from the average new beginner mm -hmm. and it makes it seem inaccessible. I've had so many people tell me that they can't come they can't come to my yoga class they can't go to yoga they can't do yoga because of their body right. and i've tried to remind people over and over and over that 
anybody can do yoga. You really can. It's it's not just for the you know the super skinny you know white ladies on Instagram. It's really for everybody. So it's a hard I think stigma for us to to break. Um, I haven't quite figured it out yet. <laughs> I agree. And I think, you know, and it's funny. So just as you were saying that, like, the thing that we all say is, you know, yoga is for everybody. And I'm just thinking, like, but my God, the word yoga is so general. Yeah. That it's like, you know, and trying to get people to understand, you know, try not understand, trying to educate people on the, all the different things. It takes a lot of time and effort. Like, maybe you're an Ashtanga person. You, maybe you're a vinyasa. Maybe you're a hatha. Maybe you're a there's so many things right. and, um, you, you know, and it's hard. Like, well, then how do you explain how that thing is best for that type of person without right. perhaps maybe f- making them feel bad? I think we've overcomplicated you know? it. I agree. I think the West has taken something that was really simple and we've, we've, okay, I don't want to go off on tangents. I might go off on tangents. Do it. Time. That's the conversation. But I think that capitalism has made really good friends with the yoga community and it's become an industry. It's like a multi-billion dollar industry. So we get a lot of people adding their spin on things, which can be wonderful. It can be amazing and, you know, can create growth within our community. But then at the same time, it's about branding. It's about an image. And that's what people see more than anything is who has more money to put into the branding, who has more money to put into the image. So that's what you're going to see more of. You're probably not going to see more of yogis like us who are just like, hey man, it's all good. Like do what feels good. That's, right. That's kind of unfortunately not as much the norm anymore. Which is weird because it didn't take long for it to spiral into this because yeah. my mom's yoga was, hey man, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Are you smelly? Are you wearing your pajamas? Great. <laughs> you know, and now it's Lululemon yeah. and fancy right. stuff. Yeah, pants that cost like $150. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I started practicing yoga, there was actually nothing called yoga pants. There weren't yoga pants. No, I think I wore sweatpants or pajamas when I first started practicing yoga. Yeah. I didn't have yoga pants. And, and if I, I mean, if I'm thinking back enough, like, and there weren't necessarily yoga mats, they were sticky mats. Right. Because you just, you needed it to be sticky. Right. And that's like one of my biggest, like, soap boxes is get a sticky mat. It doesn't matter how pretty it is right. or how thick it is, it needs to be sticky. <laughs> But whatever. But but I agree with you about the capitalism. It's really unfortunate to me that, um, you know, and I probably I give Yoga Journal a bad rap, and I th- and I think that and I think that they're changing their image a little bit because so. I've started to see bigger girls, girls with yes. more color, non girls, yes. yes. <laughs> on their covers. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, just like everything, you know, I think that with this whole thing that's even going on in our country politically. You know, the idea that if you can see somebody doing that thing, then somebody that looks like you, then you think you can do that thing. Like having the the show Veep, you know, having TV shows where we see female presidents, female vice presidents, things like that, then you're like, oh, that didn't even occur to me that that could be my thing. Right. That so that representation really matters. It really does. In pretty much all aspects, especially with, you know, we've got younger generations that are able to live an entire life with social media at yep. the forefront, um, it's kind of a make or break deal. What what can happen with that? It could be really wonderful if it's approached in the right way, or it could be really devastating. Yeah. I think I think we could see it go one of two ways in terms of body image. I feel like maybe it's improving and that there seems to be a movement more towards body confidence that seems Mm -hmm. to be happening but there's still it's still a polarizing thing we have people on the other side of it that are saying no you can't have confidence about that kind of body that's not a healthy body so it's kind of it's kind of in this place where it's kind of getting a little bit more polarized but it's leaning a little bit more towards body acceptance so it's like yeah. you, can, you can you can feel it coming and you can see it coming in like these little waves but then the backlash is always really gross yeah like if you ever see somebody on um, instagram who's in a larger body and they're doing yoga most of the comments are going to be really positive but you're always going to have those few people pushing back and saying things that are really yeah. inappropriate and gross because 
that's how they were conditioned. Yeah. It's, it's all in our conditioning. And, you know, and I've had, when I, in the past several years of having my studio and being on, you know, Facebook and all that stuff, um, I've gotten emails and I've gotten messenger comments to me, women, I'm assuming women, I think they're all women, saying, um, I've never tried yoga before. And, and these are the words that I've heard from people. Um, do you allow fatties in your class? And, and that was... Do you allow it? Yeah, they were asking because they felt that they were overweight. I don't know if I've ever seen any of these people. Yeah. These are these people, I think women, talking about themselves saying, do you, are fatties allowed in your class? I'm like, and I didn't, because I don't know a person and I'm not going to engage in that kind yeah. of conversation over social media, right. I'm not going to say, first of all, let's not call yourself a fatty. <laughs> well, let's get into that first. <laughs> You know, let's unpack that one. Right? Yeah. I mean, herein starts the the lesson of yoga. Oh. Let's not call yourself a fatty. Oh. Um, but it's but it's distressing to me that yoga has presented itself in such a way that people, women, men too, have to say, "Is a person like me accepted in that?" Oh, I get, I get. Um, it's disgusting. That's by um, men. Especially um, men that are new to yoga, like they're kind of almost asking permission to be there. Like, yeah. is it okay? Am I okay to be here? Which could be a lot of different things. Sure, could be I, from the me too thing. Yeah, I think that that could be part of it. I think some of it is is maybe coming from a from a place of do you feel safe with me here? Yeah. But it almost seems more like a is my body acceptable here? Yeah. Am I okay? Which I think. Is coming from the same place, which is which is patriarchy, where men. That's why we don't have as many men in yoga classes. Is because it's still seen as something so feminine and only you know skinny white ladies do. Which it. is ironic. Yeah. And how it was so invented. So ironic. Yeah. And we could probably go off on yeah. like a three-hour tangent about like the origins of yoga, but yeah, it's kind of created this imbalance for men as well as women, where men are like, do I actually belong here? Are male bodies? appropriate or acceptable in this space so it's almost like you're having to reassure um male students at times that yoga's for them too right and i think that's really what it is is they're asking is this for me is this okay for me to participate in this as a man because it's not typically seen it's, i think it's something like 60 or more percent yeah. of yoga practitioners in america are women it might even be like 80 percent it's know, huge it up, but it's the majority it's and the vast majority and it's mostly middle and upper middle class yeah mostly white so yeah yeah and i think i mean some of some of what we do and don't know about yoga i think is largely due to the the marketing of it. Yeah. Like, I see only skinny white girls doing yoga yeah. on the advertisements. Right. You know, and, or you've got the obligatory, you've got an Asian gal, you've got an Asian right. man, you got a black man, a black girl. I mean, like, some of them right. sprinkled in there. <laughs> they found the one person for the, <laughs> right. for yeah. the website. They're like, okay, we're going to need yeah. one black guy in this picture. <laughs> right. And then we're going to look so diverse on our website. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's unfortunate. And I think, you know, with the idea of body image and all of that, um, I think, you know, one of the struggles within a yoga class, within the culture of a yoga, the culture and community of a yoga studio itself is creating an environment where everybody can feel comfortable in their own bodies yes. around other people. Yeah. yeah. And that's what it's all about. It's hard. Yeah, acceptance of yourself. And... <sighs> so tell me, um, tell me a little bit about your background and how, because <clears throat> I know, but I want you to explain it. Okay. Um, also, like your educational background and how this is all related. Okay, yeah. Um, all right, so I've been practicing yoga for probably about like 19, 20 years. I started practicing yoga because a counselor actually recommended it to me. Uh, I think it was a school counselor when I was an undergrad at CCAD. Um, I was having panic attacks like every single day and I wasn't sleeping and they recommended that. And I, um, I went to the library and I got a VHS cassette of Rani to a <laughs> That's awesome. yoga on the beach 
and the black speedo, yep. and he's so soothing, and it was mostly just standing like warrior poses and things like that. But just the the impact was just so profound that that was kind of the start of it for me. But um, kind of like jumping forward, I've been teaching yoga, so this is my tenth year teaching yoga. Um, I decided to teach because of the impact that it had on me as somebody that has. Um, anxiety and OCD and has has had a lot of body image issues so I just felt like okay so I have this knowledge I have this experience I can see how this helped me how can I take all this stuff and then give it back to other people um, so then that kind of brought me to where I'm at now where um, I have seven months I'm not counting or anything it might be like six and a half until I get my master's uh, in social work so counseling um, I've been practicing as an SWT, so social work trainee, for a little while now, and to be able to see the connection between yoga and counseling has been so profound for me that now I can't imagine one without the other, so that's, that's kind of the direction I'm going in now, but um, to be able to use the two tools, because they're really tools to complement each other, has been just so profound for me but I guess to circle back to the body image thing um so when I first started teaching so about 10 years ago one of the things that I struggled with most was that I didn't look like a yoga teacher I'm doing air quotes right sure. now I didn't look like a yoga teacher I'm short I'm more muscular um I'm not super I don't look like a ballerina I don't look like a gymnast or whatever the thing is I even had a couple comments when I first started teaching like you don't look like a yoga teacher. And I always wonder, what the hell does What's that, that mean? Yeah. Like, what do you mean I don't look like a yoga teacher? So I, so I got that a lot. But it really messed with my head. And I would say probably the first three years of my teaching, it really took me down this like dark path where I felt like I needed to be smaller and smaller and mm. smaller to be a yoga teacher. I needed to fit in that mold. So it was as though I took all of the things that I had learned and all of the reasons why I had decided to teach yoga and I just completely pushed them down <laughs> because I needed to look like a yoga teacher. So I was teaching so many classes at that time. Like I was doing like hours of cardio a day. Um, I was teaching and demoing the whole thing. So it was usually like power yoga that I was teaching at the time because I thought that's what you're supposed to do if you're young and you want to be really skinny, you go to power yoga, which I, I absolutely see the benefits of Ashtanga and power yoga. So I'm not, I'm not talking any shit about those types of yoga because I definitely see where they're valuable for other people. But for me, I was abusing it. So yep. I took that thing that gave me peace and calm and I let the outside world influence how I felt about myself, and then I used it to abuse myself. And I ended up so, so deep in this kind of, at the time it was like, uh, the DSM is a little bit different now, Diagnostic Statistics Manual, um, had a diagnosis of EDNOS, so it was eating disorder not otherwise specified, oh. because I was using, I was literally using yoga to lose weight mm -hmm. in a lot of yoga so I was abusing it so it would be similar to somebody that is um suffering from an eating disorder and they have exercise abuse so how much yoga are you talking about um like I remember some days where I would at the end of the day try to quantify it and I would realize that I had been moving for like five hours um, and at the time, I also decided to start teaching spinning because I was oh a cyclist. God. Yeah, so I was I was teaching spinning too to kind of supplement that. And it wasn't really about the money; it was about. And at that point, it had just become an eating disorder. So I was trying to fuel myself on as little as possible while taking this yoga and spinning and the teaching, and just really just like filling my day every day with it so there were some days where it was like five six hours of activity and then I was like okay so how many calories can I eat to stay under the calories burned and then not surprisingly uh, I think this was like 2010 so like two uh, uh two years in I started feeling all this pain in my hip and so I would use my yin yoga practice to try to stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and then one day somebody um and when the gyms I was teaching at was like, you are limping. 
when you walk, you are limping on your left leg. And I was like, oh, okay, this might be a problem. So I went and I got an x-ray and I had a stress fracture on my hip. Like, that's not something that happens to people that are in their 20s. They don't get stress fractures. But it became this whole thing where the doctor was like, how much have you been eating? How many hours of exercise do you do? They actually did a bone density scan. Oh, wow. Because they were like, what? Why do you have, why have you fractured your hip? You're like 29. That doesn't make any sense. So that was kind of my wake up call. I think that was kind of the thing that it took. Um, I put in a little like plug for the Center for Balanced Living. It's in uh, Worthington. They do uh, inpatient, outpatient, um, intensive outpatient um, therapy for people with eating disorders. So I, I went there for a while and I did just regular counseling and I met with a dietitian and I changed my yoga practice. Um, I stopped teaching spinning completely. Um, I stopped teaching a lot of my yoga classes and that was about the time that I was like, I need to make some changes yeah. so I definitely I definitely slowed things down at that point and it's kind of been a journey ever since so that was kind of what led me to social work um that's kind of led me to where I'm at now where right now my practice is mostly restorative Indian um and I've really been purposeful about how I teach as well so right now um I'm teaching yin I'm teaching restorative I'm teaching gentle yoga and I'm teaching like like level one papa yoga yeah. and that's not necessarily just for me because I'm not I'm not doing everything with them anymore but it's it's kind of like a conscious effort to get other people to slow down and think about yoga in this way and to stop viewing it as a punishment because we've gotten to this point where the exercise industry and the yoga industry have kind of collaborated and made these really punishing yoga workouts and that's how most people view yoga so they're going to these practices with the same mentality that they would approach the kind of like no pain no gain kind of workouts and that's i think that's what i'm kind of trying to fight <laughs> fight from the inside out yeah <laughs> yeah so that, you know what, and it's interesting, the, your story, um, I think is similar to a lot of, a lot of women that I'm running into and a lot of articles that I've read recently of that similar thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I got into yoga and then from there, skinny, 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 yeah. you know, overworked, breaking yourself. Right, and then nobody stops you in these times either because our society values productivity so much that you're really put on a pedestal when you're doing this much. So yeah. when I was really in that, that darker place of just abusing my body, I was getting the best feedback. It wasn't mm -hmm. about my teaching style, it was about my body. Um, and I'll never forget, I had, um, after I kind of went through uh, treatment and I, I got back to a healthy weight, I started teaching a few more classes and I taught a yoga class um, and had a student who I hadn't seen in a few years come through for that class and afterwards she kind of like gave me the once over and she was like, my God, you've really put on weight. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, this was like a five pound game. Like this wasn't like oh a massive game. Like I got I got very thin, but like I'm a naturally like smaller person. I'm like yeah. five two. You have I'm little like bones. Small, I have very small <laughs> bones. The other day I tried to put on an ankle bracelet and it was like sliding off. I was like, why are my bones so small? <laughs> I can't wear most rings because they just like fall off on my hands. So so that was part of it too. But to see that that was what she had been focused on all that time. Yeah. And and then it really impacted her in a way where she felt intensely that I had gained the weight back. Like she was disappointed yeah. that I wasn't somehow serving her with this image of the of a very thin yoga teacher. So that that was hard too. That made recovery really hard. And I wonder if for like her, because I mean, you know, again, talking about representation or whatever, yeah. yoga teachers have 
it's an it's a it's a responsibility truly as an example of like the whole industry or the studio or whatever to say this is what it can be to be a female not should that are really doesn't have to be should but but you know p- students are looking at the teacher to say not only okay how do i put myself in this pose right. but like that's how she looks in those pants right and that outfit and exactly. she doesn't have rolls over the tops of her pants mm-hmm. or then so i'm like okay so now i'm going to try to be like that teacher cuz she looks great doing that mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden she gains 5 pounds and i'm like well shit now what am i supposed to do right Right. I think teaching yoga very much becomes, if you're not careful, becomes a performance rather than yeah. a service to other people. And I think that's definitely where I was at and how I was able to do that for so long um, and get to that point was that it was part of a role, it was part of a performance. So, so now being in my 30s, like, I don't want to be a person that ends up with a broken hip before they're, you know, actually elderly. And I kind of put myself a little bit of risk of that. So I'm, that is why I'm really kind of adamant about what I give back to people and how I talk to students and kind of taking myself out of the equation as like a visual for Mm -hmm. the students because um, it's not... It's not for me. Anymore. When you say taking yourself out of the equation, do you mean like you're not demoing? I'm not or? demoing as much. Okay. So if I teach a yin class or a restorative class, especially, I make sure everybody sees how to get into it. So setting up the props and things like that. But then from there, I'm not. I'm not necessarily demoing. Like I'm not going to demo um, a big forward bend. Um, because everybody's obsessed with touching their toes, and that's usually what you hear. I can't do yoga, I can't touch my toes. Then bend your knees. Yeah, I know. Bend your knees. (laughs) Bend your knees. It's like, I don't know how many times I, yeah, bend your knees. If anybody listening has one takeaway, just like bend your knees in a forward bend. Oh my gosh, it'll be okay. But so when I think of that, like, I, oh, to back up a little bit, I have a dance background. So I was a ballerina, did jazz, tap, all the things from the time I was like five until I was like 18. So I came into it with flexibility anyway. Yeah. And that kind of helped me put on the show when I was younger. And now that I'm older, I don't have the same amount of flexibility, but I also don't feel like I need to showcase my flexibility as yeah. much. Like, I'll demo um, when I feel like I have to, but I'm trying to do it less and less and less for my own well-being and for um, the well-being of people that are doing the practice. Because I remember how, what a rush I would get when I was first teaching. I'd, I'd demo, you know, some really sweet arm balance, and you'd have at least half the class going, oh, man, I can't do that just hear like a collective groan and yeah. meanwhile I'm up there like all this dopamine flooding in my brain like I'm the greatest <laughs> I am the shit look at me balancing on my arms my legs are off of the ground and mm-hmm. it was just it was it was like an addiction yeah <laughs> I mean it was releasing actual dopamine into my brain so the little reward centers of my brain would be firing up whenever I would do these really cool poses and everybody would ooh and ah and that wasn't the point right so I don't Honestly, I don't even teach arm balances anymore. I do occasionally, but like for the types of classes that I teach, and this was also purposeful, I want to, as much as possible, get people to take their ego out of their yoga practice. Yep. And that's, I think that's part of it too. Because I think ego is part of what's led us to where we are now, where people like myself think they have to be like, a negative zero in their yoga pants and so skinny and just gaunt um, to be a yoga teacher. So it's just ego. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Um, so I, I wasn't entirely sure what your age was, but, I, but, it, but it's interesting the way that you, I mean, well, not the way that you tell your story, but your story is interesting to me because you're only in your 30s yeah and you've come to this conclusion about the things that you've done to your body yeah and where and how your yoga needs to change because um the story to me sounds like it should have been oh my god after 40 years of doing this kind (laughs) of thing now i'm finally coming around to restorative and yin Mm -hmm. 
But so like, for example, Jesse Miller, you know, she's saying the same things right. like, you know, I'm coming around to teaching, yes. you know, this is what people need. And it's like, I love that. yeah, these women that are thirties, early four, I'm 42, you know, things like that, where it's like, you know, we're not, you know, retirement age. No. We're not, you know, it's not, we're not at that point in life where it's like, oh, I'm just going to sit and knit. But that's kind of like, right. for me, this is kind of that evolution of kicking my ass for 40 years and right. now, but it's happening sooner. Right. Um, I think for, for me, it was, again, that combination of counseling and yoga. So whether I was involved in counseling or even just in my own studies and and what I'm doing now just as I learned more about mental health and I learned more about yoga and what that means to me those two things have really kind of mirrored each other and have just it's almost been like an amplifier one for the other and I think for for myself at least um things like going to get therapy, you know, at the Center for Balanced Living, and then kind of, I think everybody should go to counseling, honestly. Like, I don't think that that's <laughs> yeah. one of those things where it's like, you got to be so far gone to go to counseling. I think everybody can benefit from counseling, especially if you've got a, a yoga practice, because stuff's going to come up. Yeah. Like, stuff is going to come up. You probably, everybody's probably been in a yoga class where somebody's crying on their mat, uncontrollably, <laughs> yeah. shavasana, um, especially women there's just so much trauma there's so much there, we're just like holding on to so much that I just think that everybody should go to counseling but that's my little soapbox for counseling but I think those two things have informed each other for me and have led to just this I don't know like it's it feels to me like like I've created a new part of my brain which I probably literally have <laughs> yeah um like I've rewired like I've kind of Re, if you talk about like neuroplasticity and the ability to like actually rewire our thought patterns, I think that just by doing these specific types of, you know, counseling, like EMDR is a really big one, um, in conjunction with a like yoga practice, a a grounded, rooted yoga practice, not necessarily like your power flow practice, which I think has its place too. But having those two things together just has like opened it all up and made me just hyper aware of seeing it in other people too. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just been like mind blowing in a way to see it and to see more people, like you mentioned Jesse, like that are doing that, that are saying, okay, so here's where I was. I don't want this anymore. You can take it back. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go hang on a bolster for the next hour. Right. <laughs> I'm just gonna breathe and that's my yoga practice today. And I think we've got a lot more people out there that are willing to do that as well, but they don't necessarily know how. We don't know how to slow down. We, we don't have any idea, and we're kind of not taught to slow down. We're always taught to be more productive, to do more in less time. Um, and we're all, I would say all collectively, we just burn out. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be that way. And I think burnout is, it manifests, and I think it happens in many different ways. I mean, physically, I can feel that in my body. Mm -hmm. Like, my muscles are just really tired. Mm -hmm. And, but also mentally and emotionally, just from the things that I do to myself mentally, like my thoughts, yeah. you know, the words going on in my head, but then also the words and thoughts going on all over the place right. in this country, in the news, on the internet, all of these things, um, you know, that, that, um, overload. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, as a yoga teacher, um, you know, one of the most important responsibilities is creating space for people to come in and giving them, allowing them to stop. Right. Right. And that's, and that's really what I'm looking to do as well. Um, I decided I'm doing workshops for the first time ever. I've Good job. A four part series circle back a little bit I never had the confidence in myself for some reason to do workshops because it all tied into the really? same kind of thing God, I, I love like, workshops I, yeah. if I could do workshops all day long that's I feel I like yeah that's that's kind of the direction I'm headed with with counseling and, and yoga but yeah I was like oh nobody's gonna want to listen to me they just want to see me doing cool stuff <laughs> 
So what are your workshops on? Uh, workshops, uh, I've, I've titled it The Art of Slowing Down. Nice. Um, and I wanted to create four-part series. Honestly, I want it to be a 1,000-part series. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, and for the rest of your life. It, where basically I'm sharing all of these things that I've learned um, over the last, like, 20 years that have helped me heal. So there's a yin yoga component, there's a restorative yoga component, there's a yoga nidra component. Like, yoga nidra is yeah. incredibly healing. When we talk about the, the you know, taking counseling and taking yoga and kind of putting them together, and you think of Richard Miller, he's kind of taken yoga nidra and turned it into eye rest, and we have all this scientific evidence to show that it's, you know, helping people with their symptoms of PTSD and anxiety and all of those things. So so that piece is really important to me. And then kind of taking it and putting it all together, taking the things that I know about um, mental health and counseling and, and a, a slow and grounded yoga practice and putting them together so that other people can use these to hopefully slow down. Because we're all running on our sympathetic nervous system, we're all running on fight or flight. Like most of us don't know how to get into the paras or stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and get into that rest state. And we don't. We yeah. we're not supposed to if we listen to all the messages all the coming at us. Even with our yoga practice, we're not supposed to. We're yeah. supposed to sweat and work so hard that we're completely drained at the end of our practice. And I could see how that could have some place for some people at some times, but I feel like that's sending the opposite message about what we really need. And I was, I was describing it recently. If you had a partner or a best friend come to you telling you that they are emotionally burnt out or physically burnt out, they're mentally burnt out, would you tell them to go take the hottest, sweatiest, most intense power vinyasa flow to deal with that stuff. No, you wouldn't. You'd probably tell them that they need to do something that's soothing and calming and grounding because you love them. So why why in the hell are we not doing this for ourselves? Why are we buying into the messages that we need to punish ourselves and stay productive when that's what has us burn out in the first place? And again, disclaimer, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not actually talking shit about any specific type of yoga. I see the need for all of them, but I'm just saying, like, even if you do, like, Jesse, we'll bring up Jesse again, and this will be, like, an hour about Jesse, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, so she's an Ashtangi. Ashtanga yeah. yoga is a very intense practice, but she's somebody else that's taking it, and then she's balancing it out with yep. restorative. That's what I'm trying to get at. Like, go do your vinyasa power flow. Go sweat your ass off for 90 minutes or whatever it is. But don't do that every day. Right. That's putting your body in a lot of times this state of overdrive. So you're you're building more adrenaline. You're building more cortisol. You're you're building up all these things that are just going to keep you tired. So you're you're going past even a lot of times, especially if it's a very heated, very powerful practice. You're going past your aerobic threshold and your anaerobic threshold, which we're not really even supposed to be in that for very long either. So if your heart rate is elevated to that level for 90 minutes and you're not balancing it out with a restorative practice, you're putting you're actually putting your health at risk. And I think that that's not something that we talk about because it's like a badge of honor to say that you're doing this every day. So yeah, that's yeah, that's where I'm trying to <laughs> break some stuff up if I can for myself and then for other people as much as I can too. Um, can we do some vocab here? So you brought up EMDR. Yeah. What's that? So um, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. So it's a type of therapy method that involves bilateral stimulation. So bilateral meaning two-sided, bilateral stimulation of the brain. Um, and that can be done with light. So maybe you've got a light box and the light is bouncing back and forth to a very specific pattern. Um, maybe it's through sound, so you might get just like a beat going from left to right to left to right. Or some some practitioners will even actually like tap on your knee, so left, right, left, right, left, right. And then as you are getting this bilateral stimulation, you are going through whatever trauma or feeling 
or thought about yourself that you have in your mind. So you're not actually talking. So as this is happening and you're going through this, the bilateral stimulation is helping you to reprocess the either the event or the feeling or belief about yourself. And it is clinically proven to work. So it's an evidence-based practice. So social work, we love our evidence-based practices. Um, so it has a lot of research for PTSD, for people that have um, experienced combat. Um, I read one study that was saying that um, as little six sessions, that some of the veterans that were involved in some of the testing were not meeting criteria for PTSD anymore. Um, that it was actually helping them to reprocess their trauma in a way that it took, it, it basically takes its power away. So it doesn't erase the memory, it doesn't erase the feeling, but it takes its power away through that reprocessing. Um, and it's, it's very strange. <laughs> it's a very strange It's so simple. Experience. Yeah, it seems like it should be some kind of like woo-hoo woo -hoo kind of thing yeah. where you're just like, yeah, sitting in a room while somebody taps on your knees or <laughs> yeah. moves their hand in front of your face. But this is evidence based. Like we know that it works and, and I've and I've done it and the effect is is profound. Even in one session. It's just it's just amazing. And everybody I think that knows about it thinks maybe it's specifically for trauma, but it can actually be used for negative beliefs that we hold about ourselves mm. as well, which is another thing that I think we're we're talking about, like big picture with this too, is like how do we view ourselves when we think about our yoga practice? So if we're coming to yoga with thoughts like, I am not enough, or I am too much, I'm not good enough, EMDR can help you kind of look at these things, determine where they came from and kind of reprocess it. And it actually leads your brain to replace that negative belief with a positive and reality-based belief because most of the stuff going through our head is, is if you go with like cognitive behavioral therapy, they are really big on like cognitive distortions, mm. but most of what we think is just a distortion. So it kind of takes that idea and it kind of flips it and gives it a positive reframe. So that's, I guess, a big plug for EMT. <laughs> yeah. I first, um, I read about it. So I've had several people recommend the book the body keeps the score. Oh, yes. So I finally read it. Yes, yes, yes. Holy cow, that was life changing. Yes. Everybody um, should read that. Yoga practitioners, everybody should read yeah. that. Yeah. Anybody, we've all experienced trauma. Yeah, and I think that, you know, having read that and also over the past, I would say probably five, five years, I've um, listened to TED Talks, read articles, yeah. various things about, and I think you and I have talked about, like, the, and, and even in this book, it's talking about, the idea that, I mean, PTSD as a diagnosis, air quotes, is, I mean, it's not, it's not specific enough. It's yeah. not good enough anymore. Yeah. And so many things get rolled into maybe the idea of trauma, mm -hmm. but, but there, but, you know, and he talks about in the book, like so many different kinds of trauma and this right. kind can be treated by medication perhaps, but this one can't. The same right. thing doesn't respond the same way. So I think that's fascinating. Right, and another piece of it that's really unfortunate is that our perception, just based on what we see in movies, TV, things like that, of PTSD is that it's something that only happens to people if they've seen combat, mm. if they've been in the military, if they've experienced something like an actual murder or um, natural disaster, but our brains, are so much more vulnerable than we realize yeah. that I think people don't seek out treatment for actual PTSD or trauma because they don't think that it is bad enough. Yeah. That it's not on that level, so what can they possibly do? So all of these other things we get to take over and then people end up with anxiety disorders, depression, things like that, and all symptoms from depression. I would say... Yeah. In, in terms of like the, the counseling that I've been doing, I would say everybody, whatever they're coming in for, it always stems from trauma. And yeah. most of the time, when people come in and they fill out their intake paperwork, there's a question that asks, have you experienced any trauma, significant trauma? I would say most people check no, but then yeah. once I start asking more questions, it's always yes for mm -hmm. everybody. And then that's always the root of it. And we're just, I think, 
we have some misconceptions about trauma that lead us to not deal with it too. Because mm-hmm. we're like, oh, I wasn't in the military, so nobody died. It's not a big deal. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm right. still here, I'm still moving around, but meanwhile, they've just got all this baggage that's going, you know, undealt with and just accumulating other stuff with it. And I think, you know, in talking about this, this sort of different levels or different kinds of trauma, I mean, I, I might even argue that there are some people who have been traumatized by yoga. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, first of all, something as, as basic as you've been hurt in a yoga class physically, yeah. but shamed, shamed. Um, outright. Or out. yeah, you know, or what you what you've said to yourself for your own comparisons and right. things like that. It's it's, and that that is one of my biggest fears is people getting hurt because of yoga. Right, it happens all the time, and um, part of it's ego. Sometimes it can be maybe somebody's not picking up on the cues of the teacher, but. I don't know. Can we talk a little bit about adjustments, hands-on adjustments? I have a lot of feelings about that. So as Mm -hmm. I've been doing all these things, I've been really researching and studying um, trauma-sensitive yoga, Mm -hmm. um, which can be done in a counseling session. It can be done anywhere as a teacher. But one of the things that it posits is that we don't really need to be touching students. We can yep. get them where they need to be through our cues, um, maybe through modeling. But the reason behind that is, when we think about trauma and how we all have something going on, um, if we can think of statistics, what is it? One in four women has been or will be assaulted at some point. So when you think of the number... And that's of based people, on just how many have reported, that's by how many the way. Have reported. <laughs> <laughs> That's and what then we know. think of how many haven't reported. So yeah. think about that for It's probably worse than we think. And then no. think about the percentage of our students that are women. And it's it's going to be most of them. Um, so do we really need to, say in a down dog, come up behind someone and take a hold of their hips and pull back? Well, that mm-hmm. can feel really wonderful and... There's a whole other conversation we could have around that about consent. Is it always necessary right. to to do that in that way? Um, in our language, um, using inclusive language um, in our in our cueing and how we talk to students, um, thinking about even things as simple as the music that we play. It's it goes so so deep, and it may I think it could scare a lot of teachers and think, well, what's the point? If everybody's traumatized, what am I supposed to do? I can't do anything, right? Well, th- there's actually a lot you can yeah. do. Um, and I think that's where maybe as, as yoga teachers, we need to all rethink the hands-on adjustments. I think some of it's okay. Some some studios will do things like put your hands on your belly and shavasana if you don't want me to touch you. But, but the other piece of that is... A lot of women that have experienced trauma, they want to be accepted. They want to feel like they're doing it right. And I would say that's probably the majority of us. We want to feel like we're doing it right. So if they're given the option of getting a physical adjustment and not getting a physical adjustment, they may be going for that physical adjustment because they want the validation. Yeah. And they may not feel safe in their bodies with that adjustment, but they're going to do it because they're going to feel that acceptance from the instructor. And that's, and that's, that goes really deep. That's a really great point because I remember, um, you know, when I, cause I, and I'll be very honest, I've always been honest with my students and with everybody. Um, prior to actually opening a studio, I probably went to like five classes. Mm-hmm. I, my practice has always been at home. Yeah. And when I went into a class, um, you know, the, go right ahead if you want to eat that, um, the, you know, large classes or whatever, for me, I felt, um, I don't know if the word validated, I don't know if it was validated, possibly, but I felt accepted, included, um, when, you know, I, I think that there's, there's probably in some of the studios around here, there's probably an instruction to the teachers saying, you must touch every single student by the end of class. I've heard that. And so I, I felt like, oh my God, she acknowledged me because there's 40 people in this class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is why I like teaching smaller classes because 
you can be acknowledged without somebody coming up and lifting your leg a little higher. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a very good point that you just made because um, I think there are other ways of feeling acknowledged, feeling part of the group. Mm -hmm. The community, I, I think, you know, the community aspect, I think, is way more important than validation that you're, quote unquote, doing it right. Mm -hmm. Because that leads to so many different, I mean, it, it leads so many directions as far as like how, how, why you came to class, what you're getting from class, how you exist in a class. If you're trying to make the teacher happy, if you're trying to prove yourself to other people. Um, but then there are also the, also the people that feel like, well, if the teacher came up and touched me, that meant that I was doing it wrong. Oh, absolutely. That's how I felt when I first started practicing in studios because I, I had a home practice for probably like, five or six years before I started practicing in studios and um, if I was uh, adjusted I automatically took that to mean that I wasn't doing it right and yeah. that I was not as um, I wasn't as good at yoga like I wanted to be good at yoga in the way that I was good at dance so I took the two mm. things and I kind of smushed them together a little bit and I think a lot of people do that I had a um, Two, two separate students yesterday, because I taught two classes um, at Tribe, and in each class, I had a new person say to me that they were embarrassed about coming in to take a class because they either hadn't done yoga in a while or they were new to yoga, and I was yeah. like, don't, <laughs> I said, don't let anybody be a yoga bully to you, and that yep. first and foremost means you. Do not yoga bully yourself into yeah. feeling like you need to come in here and do everything perfect. Nobody's coming in here to do everything perfect. That's not the point of it. If you do it perfectly, why are you even coming? Like you need <laughs> to, to show to, off. Like, look how perfect to I show am. Show off. Yeah, like, yeah. Look at me. I'm <laughs> so good at yoga. Like the idea yeah. of being really good at yoga doesn't even. It's not a thing. It, it doesn't make any sense. So no. I had to. Yeah. So that that comes up a lot too. Where newer students are like, oh, don't look at me. I'm so embarrassed. And nobody's looking at them. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're also focused on our own shit that we don't even yes. notice the person next to us. Nobody's seriously sitting on their mat going, oh my god, they can't even touch their toes. What right. is she doing? Nobody cares. Well, but, I mean, if there is that person <laughs> in the class, then I would recommend to that person, mm -hmm. you know who you are, right. you know, um, if you're thinking that, then... You know, get yourself onto your own mat. Get your right. mind off of that other person's mat. What? Yeah. What is it that's bringing that up in you? Why do you need to feel that validation? Right. Why? Why does her forward fold bother you so much? Right. <laughs> right. And I kind of, as a, yeah, as a teacher, like I, I care a lot less about how anyone looks mm -hmm. in a in a particular shape. Um, when I first started, I think just because a lot of us do when we're newer, I felt like I needed everybody to almost like micromanage their shape. Yeah. Like in the Aesthetically trying, pleasing yeah, and, and all that. Yeah, and like bring your hand up further, you know, take that foot in a little bit, take that foot back a little bit and just nitpick the hell out of their whatever they were in. And now I'm kind of at this point where I can look around and I can say, okay, that looks a little wonky, but I'm not yeah. going to say anything right. because they're not going to get hurt. Yeah, that's my number one goal. They're stru exactly. Structurally, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine if their hand is facing the wall instead of the floor. Whatever. Yeah, <laughs> right. You know, and that's, you know, I was actually just talking to a student in my beginner class on Tuesday. Um, you know, the idea of should, and I, you know, I like to say, like, there are no shoulds in yoga. There are shoulds in anatomy. Yeah. You know, it's like, for proper alignment, just so you don't hurt yourself. Right. Like, let's keep should. your knee over your ankle. Yeah, I was going to say, you shouldn't internally rotate your knee. Yes. Like, let's <laughs> protect your damn knees, um, you know, and things like that. But, but other than that, like, feel, feel the pose. Right. Don't do the pose for me. This is for you and your body, and your body is different than my body. Right. And, you know, and your intention right now is different than my intention. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and then there's like a stigma for some people around using props too. It's like yeah. you can stack those blocks Tell the to Lord. the ceiling. Use them all. Too. I'm buying more props because I don't have enough for the studio, I know, and I only hold seven people in here. Christ. Three bolsters for that. Oh word, shit. Man. I don't care. Like, yeah. If that's what you need. Do it. It's not about me. So, so I yeah. I feel like I I try really hard to make sure that people are aware of. To try to drop the ego about yeah. this stuff. Yeah. And it's so hard, and I still do it. If I take a class, I think I still, I'm still i still fighting with myself because um, I'm thinking, oh, I'm a yoga teacher, and I'm in this class. If people in here realize I'm a yoga teacher, I've got to nail every single pose, and yep. it's got to be perfect. So that's so that's kind of my my struggle at the moment that I'm trying to work through, and I'm getting better at it. Yep. Like, if I need child's pose when everybody else is doing something really cool i'm gonna do it but it's yeah. still it's still there it's still like really pretty deeply embedded in my head and i found this for a lot of people too yeah um, a lot of other teachers or somebody that's been practicing a long time it's like nope i've got to take a vinyasa right now i don't have the energy to do it but she said vinyasa <laughs> and i gotta take a vinyasa uh -huh. when really they're like i need child's pose I yeah. need to just hang out in down dog. I need to go get a drink of water. Yeah. <laughs> like we're not we're not listening to our bodies and that's the whole friggin' point. <laughs> and I think you know, and I think it is it is such a fine balance of trying to get people to fight to communicate with themselves to understand, you know, like we, we always talk about like sit with the discomfort. Yeah. Okay, well, I hope you have an understanding of the difference between discomfort and pain. And injury right. is pain. Right, is it pinching or is right. it just uncomfortable? Right, <laughs> and, and you know, and so, and that, I think, runs its own risk of having that kind of a thing because it's like, well, but she's staying in that pose and I really want to get out of it. But yeah. if I get out of it, then what does that say about me? She gets to sit with her discomfort a little bit longer. Yeah, you know, she's, she's better. Yeah, she's <laughs> yoga-ing better than I am. Aww. You know, and so, you know, there is that challenge of trying to explain to a student, new or having been there for a long time, that, um, you know, you do need to honor, what do you think? What do you feel right. about right now? Don't worry about how you did this pose yesterday. Right, yeah. I like to tell people that too, especially in balancing poses. It's like you could do this pose oh my God. five different times in one day, and each time it would be different. Yeah. Your balance changes probably by the minute. Yeah. Um, even if we've been practicing a long time. So I think that's, yeah, that's an important piece to remember too, because we all, I think we all get so caught up in it, even as teachers, that we want it to look, always look perfect, the aesthetics of it. And that's, yeah. that's totally missing the point. Yeah. So, yeah, to be able to, yeah, I guess that's where I'm at, is, is working on those things for myself so I can be a better teacher. Yeah. Um, and then being really honest that I struggle with those things, too. Like, I've told students that. I'm like, yeah, sometimes, like, I fall down a lot. Like, I don't even, I don't even usually do this pose. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, my hips are too tight to do this one, so I'm just going to describe it to you. <laughs> right. You know, oh, and that's, yeah, when I was, when I was first getting started, I remember, there are all these, I don't want to call them scams because I don't really know what they are, but anyway, there are these, these people who have, mostly women, who have these sort of online businesses where they can um, consult with you on how you should be a teacher and so on and so forth. And so I, so, and they're making gobs of money doing it. Yeah. Um, so I set myself up for a 15, 20 minute conversation with this woman mm -hmm. and for, I, I left feeling like shit and like, yeah. I'm still scarred from the things Ooh. that she told me. Um, like, you know, the number one thing is, you know, well, you need to do the pose before you can teach it. Okay. I don't know about that. I mean, I understand. Maybe I never can. I mean, I understand the pose. Yeah. I understand how to get into it. I understand the, you know, the foundation of it and so forth. So that stuck with me for a long time. Yeah. And I mean, she shamed me that like she named some sort of random muscle in the leg. Yeah. And I didn't know it. And she's like, "You need to know more anatomy." before you and, I, and so I left that feeling like well, why am I even looking into being a yoga teacher 
<laughs> you know? You've seen stuff like this before. You'll see it sometimes on online yoga forums where someone will pose a genuine question, yoga teacher forums, yep. they'll pose a genuine question about maybe a student that they have or a pose that they're trying to wrap their head around teaching, and they'll occasionally be met with these other teachers responding, well, it sounds like you don't know what you're doing. It sounds like you need to study more of this or do more of this or blah, 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 as if there are, you know, some kind of yoga authority. And again, not the point. Right. <laughs> and as a, as a community of teachers, I think we're really disjointed and disconnected from each other. And I, that is, I find that really painful because I feel like, I think this conversation, conversations like this are amazing and wonderful and beautiful, but they're, they're not happy very often like we could we should be helping each other I mean I understand and then capitalism plays in and we all need to make our money and pay our rent and things like that but but how can we how can we take this and support each other because if you and I are sitting here talking about these things other Other people are 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 thinking about it and they might not know how to verbalize it or, or they might feel really alone and quit teaching yeah like how many people do you know I know a lot maybe you don't know as many went through a teacher training and then never taught a class. Oh, lots. There are so many out there and they feel unsupported. You're kind of on your own little island as a teacher a lot of the time. Even if you get in at a studio, you might not necessarily see other teachers or have those connections unless you really go out of your way to do it. Right. Um, So yeah, bridging that gap, I think, I don't know how to do it. I feel like stuff like this helps. Um, Yeah, just, just getting other teachers to engage with each other and support each other rather than try to... To be competitive. To be competitive and, in that yeah. way. Like, we've all, like, everybody wants to pay their bills and eat. Yeah. But, like, beyond that, what do we really need to not associate with other teachers for? Well, I mean, because the truth is, is, like, number one, I don't even know the statistics anymore for Columbus, but we have uh, over 200 yoga studios just in Columbus. Wow. Yeah, it's ridiculous. There, I mean, right now... Um, if some of these buildings were gone, I mean, I could see one, I'm counting myself, one, two, three, there are at least four yoga studios right in this like three block radius right here. And that's just in the last 10 years. Yeah. When I got my teacher training, it was in, uh, 2008 at Balance, they had different ownership then. And we were one of the only studios in the area at that time. Yeah, Balanced and Yoga and High, they're, yeah, they're know, like the, the oldest. The OGs. The OGs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, they've changed and have gobs of locations. And yeah, then they, since uh, then, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there are a ton of yoga studios all over the place, which means there are a ton of yoga teachers. There's a lot. All over the place, which, you know, yes, I think there's an argument to be said that. Probably there are a lot of people that have gone towards yoga teacher that maybe didn't need to. Right. Maybe they thought that was the next step. I mean, there are also a lot of training. There are a lot, I have a problem with there are some teacher training sessions that are also geared towards, quote unquote, deepening your practice. I've seen that too. Yeah. I kind of feel like maybe one or the other. Like, let's make this a teacher training. Right. Or let's make this deep in your practice. I think so too. Because if you're not going to utilize it to give back to other people and you want to deepen your practice, I feel like that's separate because deepening your practice is about deepening your practice. Teaching is about taking this and giving it back. So I, yeah, I would agree that it's challenging for me to, to, to sort of wrestle with that one. Yeah, and it did deepen my practice, but I knew that I wanted to to teach, teach to give back, to kind of serve other people with this this practice that had been so helpful for me. And I can't, I don't know, I can't imagine approaching it and then just using it to, I don't know. Yeah. Just be better at yoga. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, because that's not a thing. Yeah, as we've already determined, that's not a thing. Right. Yeah. Maybe it's another thing to put on a business card if you're doing some other thing. I don't know. Right. I don't know. There's so many yoga teachers. I don't even know if anybody knows this anymore. <laughs> I, I, I know, right? Like, I just assume, like, probably there are a bunch of yoga teachers in my classes. So, you know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think I mostly take classes with yoga teachers at this point. <laughs> yes. I teach at, at, at Tribe, and there's so many, like, it's like half, I would say more than half the people that come through, they're like, oh, I teach at so-and-so. And yes. I'm like, cool, got it. And you, yeah. get, I mean, you get other people that don't, but yeah, I get a lot of, but I love teaching to teachers, 
because it was just something like, like special and magical it. about it. Yeah, like, like we're all, we all look completely different in each pose and everybody knows what to do to modify themselves. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, am I even working right now? Like, this is great. I'm yeah. just going to yeah. let you guys go with it. <laughs> Well, because it's true. Like, there's there are some days where it's just like I just want to like stop talking, and somebody tells somebody me what to do. Tell me what to do. I said that after I took a, a I'm tired class of my own recently, voice. and that was literally what I said. I was like, I'm so glad somebody just told me what to do for the last hour because I'm tired of thinking about what comes next. Right. Just tell it. Just tell me. Where? What am I doing next? You tell me. Well, and I think that that also points to <laughs> the the um, the notion of self care. Oh yes. For yoga teachers in addition to non-yoga teachers, obviously. Right, right. yeah. Um, I was listening to a really good podcast. Oh, I'll, have to, I'll have to remember what it was because I can't think of what it was. But the focus was on the mental health of yoga teachers and kind of circling back to what you said at first was everybody assumes that we all have our shit together, that we don't have any mental health issues because we teach yoga and that we wake up each morning just blissful and grateful for all that we have, <laughs> which there might be like a little bit of that some days, but that kind of creates a stigma where where probably most of us came to yoga with, with stuff, with baggage. Like mm-hmm. we don't we don't end up here because we're feeling like really awesome mostly most people don't come to yoga because they're like i feel so I'm perfect good. i just feel so perfect <laughs> every day that i just want others to see me in action mm-hmm. um so so then it does create the stigma where we're like well, i can't let other people know about this right. because i have this image show. but we can and i think that's maybe part of some of the solution too is to talk about self-care talk about this stuff in classes talk about you know Without too much self disclosure, because we're kind of in a vulnerable place as yeah. teachers. Um, we've got that really gross kind of like guru mentality thing that can happen with a lot of people where they want a guru, they want to latch on to somebody. So we have to really be careful with our boundaries and what we disclose. But we can still talk about struggles that we've had in the past or how how important it is to look at yoga through the lens of self care, yeah. rather than as a punishment or. Like a circus. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's true. I mean, there are some days where I come in and I'm like, I feel like a shit show. Yeah. Yeah. But then sometimes just seeing other people and being able to, you know, get them through their own shit is like mm-hmm. the gift in itself, even if we're not like, I don't know, making millions of dollars, which is nice. Skeptical little yoga teachers that are making millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah. Good for them, but how does that, how do you even? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, How does that happen? I feel like that's too much work. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Um. Uh. Yeah. Uh. I think we've talked about a lot. I don't know how to recap all of that. Do you need to? I don't think we need to. Because I think people just listen to it. Yeah. Thanks. Like, yeah. Those are if, great ideas. If you need to recap, yeah, listen to it again. Right. <laughs> Give you, yeah, I'll give you guys homework. With counseling, um, I always give people homework. I don't get to give people yoga homework. Yeah, my homework for people listening is to think about how your yoga practice is serving you. Like, really think about it. Maybe meditate on it, maybe journal about it. And think about how it's really serving you and figure out if there's anything you can let go of. Like, is there any ego stuff you can let go of? Um about how you teach or how you approach your practice. Um, yeah, I guess that would be my, my takeaway. Like, think about I'm like, here are my horror stories. Don't be like me. Like, I'm your yeah. ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of yoga past, don't yeah. Don't go down that road. Yeah, so I guess that's, I don't know, I guess that's kind of my journey now, too, is getting people to not make mistakes that I made if I can. <laughs> but, but I mean, at the same time, though, like, but we learn from our mistakes, right? Yeah. Like, if yeah, if true. life is perfect, then I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to learn from my perfections. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it would be really good, though. Right? Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and this morning, one of the things that I re re shared on Facebook, one of my friends posted a clip of a TED talk talking about, you know, what you really need is a coach. We all need a coach. And mm-hmm. this this guy was a surgeon. And, yeah. and just the idea of, you know, you may think that you're an expert, but the best people, everybody needs somebody 
to look at them and yeah. help them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we shouldn't have to. Feel, I feel like that's kind of our mentality in our in our country too. Is that we're very very focused on looking out, looking out number one, yeah. being an individual, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, and we look past the idea of community because we've kind of gotten ourselves to this point where. We feel like we need to solve our own problems. We're the only one that can do it. We've got to walk it off. And then we're neglecting this really important piece of ourselves and the fact that we are designed to be parts of communities. We're social animals. Yeah, we're supposed to. We need each other. You know, yoga teachers need each other. Um, Counselors, every counselor probably has a counselor or should have a counselor. Yeah. If you're... I would even I would even go so far as to say yoga teachers should probably go to counseling once in a while too because we're absorbing um, a lot of stuff sometimes yeah. too and we're dealing with our own stuff so just to have that person that kind of like outside observer not rely on pulling ourselves up by our yeah. straps all the time I think is really important too. Well said. Well, thank you. And now we're going to do a Thai yoga massage. I know. Self-care, y'all. Yay! Awesome! (laughs) Well, thank you for listening or watching. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please click like or subscribe. And also consider becoming a Patreon patron. Thank you so much to my Patreon patrons, which Lauren is actually one of them. Um, Thank you to Chris and Nancy and Lauren, Athne, Uh, where am I at? Okay. Um, Jeremy, Vince, Marianne, and Anne, our newest. Thank you so much. I hope to make you proud with all of the things, all the content coming up soon. Uh, as I've promised and will deliver, I will be offering free streaming to Patreon patrons only. These past few weeks of getting used to the new studio and the space have been not only just to figure out how to be in it, but also, after having had several classes now, I'm getting a better idea of where I'm going to put the camera for the streaming class. So um, hopefully we're going to have that up and running soon. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye, everyone.